As promised last week, we're going to keep the flow going with uh, the 1903 A3 we promised to you last week. In 1940, the British had an issue in Dunkirk where they had to do a tactical retreat back to England. Left them very low on weapons. Looking for weapons, they came to Remington and asked if they would produce the Springfield rifle in 303 British. It was decided that they would not. However, they would produce it in 3006 for England to use. In 1941, the Lend-Lease Act was passed, which would allow Remington to produce the guns and ship them to England. The English purchased 134,000, a contract for 134,000 weapons. In April of 1941, the equipment which lay in Rock Island since 1920 was shipped to New York for Remington to begin assembling 1903 rifles. The first rifles were produced in October and accepted by ordinance in October of 1941. However, in December of 1941, with the U.S.'s entry into World War II, the contract was Britain was canceled and U.S. ordinance asked Remington to produce 500,000 1903 rifles. They wanted to produce at 1,000 a day. With the increase they needed, they wanted to go from 1,000 to 3,000 rifles. And in March, Remington said, we can't do it using the 1903. We need to make some modifications. So from March to June, Remington and Ordnance got together and said, how can we simplify the manufacture of the O3 and still have a reliable battle weapon? Well, what they did, Mike, where's the gun? Oh man, Earl, did I forget to bring the gun? Dang. Let's try something I read about on the internet. It's called Swedish Mauser Magic. Now hold your hands out. Let's see if we can make one appear. <laughs> Mike, it worked. Depend I knew on, it would, or uh, I knew it would. Depend on those Swedes. So this is, this is the 1903A3. Now, we talked about redesign to make 3,000 rifles a day. If you remember last week, we talked about the 1905 site, which was on the 1903. 17 parts. We reduced that to five parts with an aperture sight. Aperture sight was also ranged only out to 800 yards. Everything on the 1903 was milled. On the 1903A3, we started using stamped parts. Some of the stampings that were made is the lower band, lower band retaining spring, extractor collar, magazine follower, the magazine, butt swivel assembly, and of course the aperture sight. Now one other change they made, uh, when it came to barrels, Remington started making four roof barrels just like on the 03, the 1903, the Britain at the time also was using two groove barrels in their end field. So Ordnance did a test and said, let's see if it'll work. They did the test and found that there was not a real difference in the accuracy of the guns. So a Remington could come with a four groove barrel or two groove barrel. Now Remington produced 1,084,000 1903 A3s. We needed more production, so Smith Corona, the typewriter people, also started making firearms, and they produced 234,580. Now, Smith Corona barrels will either be manufactured by High Standard or Savage. And Savage made barrels early for Smith Corona, and if you're really lucky, you'll find one that has six grooves in it. Each one of the barrels is marked by the manufacturer, ordnance stamp, and the month and date that it was produced. There are some minor differences between the guns that were made by Remington and Smith Corona. Of course, one of the obvious is the manufacturer and also the butt plate. Uh, Remington and Smith Corona used a different number of checkers per inch on the butt plates. Other than that, we basically have the same gun. Most of the guns are in a straight stock. However, they did have two other stocks, the Scant and the C stock, which we'll show you at the end of the video. The reason you don't see a lot of 1903s with that type of stock is because they were not approved until 1944 and production of the 1903 A3 was stopped in February of 1944. 
This is one of my favorite guns of all time. Uh, the sights make it a lot easier to use than in 1903 with the aperture sight, especially as you get older eyes, in other words, over the age of 30. Stampings don't affect the, don't affect the gun at all. Finish on the gun may not be as nice as on a 1903. Uh, the barrels, you'll see machining marks on the barrels. But don't forget, we were trying to produce as many guns as we could, as quick as we could, to make it to the battlefield. Now, Remington not only made guns for us in World War II, but they also produced a lot of ammunition. For example, Britain, they supplied 30 and 50 caliber rounds at the Frankfurt Arsenal. They expanded that in World War II. The Lake City plant, from design to manufacturing ammunition, took all of 10 months and employed 21,000 people. Remington also started a plant in Denver where they produced 10 million 30 caliber rounds per day. Salt Lake City, they had up and running in six months. Of course, they were making manufacturing or ammunition in Bridgeport. And in 1942, when brass became hard to find in Lowell, Massachusetts, they repurposed a cotton mill to produce steel cases. At Peter, Min Peter King Mill, they produced 21 million 30 caliber carbine rounds. Remington produced over 16 billion rounds of ammunition for World War II. As far as employment, in 1939, Remington had 4,000 employees. Four years later, in 1943, they employed 82,500 people. So not only was Remington a huge factor in producing arms and ammunition, also was a huge employer during World War II. Now we'll show you the other two stocks so you get an idea of what the Scant and C stock are. Okay, this is the C stock. You can see it has a full pistol grip on it. And this is the Scant stock. You can see it just has a smaller pistol grip. It was made because some of the stocks, you couldn't get a full pistol grip on it, so they went with an abbreviated grip. Again, you don't find this on a lot of original guns because it was an improvement until 1944. Now, as we're talking about the 1903A3, it's very, very difficult to find a gun that is in all original condition. Because after the war, these guns were sold to civilians, and one of the, they were given to VFWs for ceremonial guns, and they were also used at colleges for ROTC, called drill rifles. Uh, once they became obsolete for drill rifles, they were sold on the commercial market, uh, most of the guns you'll find today, or I shouldn't say most, a lot of the guns you'll find today are drill rifles that have been repurposed. In other words, they're sent out to a professional to have a new barrel installed and to have uh, them made usable again. You'll also find a mix of original and reproduction parts. Now, every gun was inspected. And if you're lucky, you'll find one that has a cartouche FJA, that's for Frank J. Atwood, who was the inspector for both Remington and Smith Corona. As far as the ammunition, warning from last week about only using uh, ammunition specifically for guns from World War II, the PPU or the M2 ball also is holds true. Now, if you really like shooting your gun, something you might wanna try is cast bullets. Either buy your cast bullets or cast your own. It's very interesting hobby. It adds another dimension to it. And if you get involved in it, there's the Cast Bullet Association to join. And they publish a magazine six times a year with information on cast bullet shooting. They also have postal and in-person tournaments. I hope you enjoyed this video. And next week, we'll show you another one. Thank you much. Thanks a lot, Earl. Yep. Thank you, Mike.